Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate being here. Um, and I'll uh, ask Cap over there to be my uh, volume monitor. <laughs> it's been a while since I've uh, spoken in a room uh, of such <clears throat> important people. And so I want to get this right and uh, hope I do a good job for you and for the group. Your volume is perfect. Good, 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 good to hear. At least I got something. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you, honor you, and praise you this day. Be with us as we share your word and meet each member of your class of warriors. Find at least one pearl of wisdom from this message. Please watch over this message. It is our, our intention to honor and praise you. Thank you for our time together. Amen. Very good. So a special thanks to every man's Bible class. I've been a member, uh, although I didn't get my card, I'm not sure about that, um, <laughs> for, for almost a year, and I've been thrilled to be here. It's been quite an honor to be in this group of men um, and the lovely ladies to step in for time. Um, and uh, I have two goals uh, today. One is to bring one nugget of wisdom to each member of the class, uh, and the other is not to have my membership revoked. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I truly treasure this class and uh, each member. Again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I felt the call to speak after uh, sitting through uh, John Dry's message, uh, where he shared his growth through First Presbyterian um, and the guidance of a great coach that he had in his life and his and a message along with that. Uh, and I feel especially challenged because of the teachers we've had in this class. Um, last week, uh, Dr. Brad Trick, and who helped me identify uh, with Paul relative to speaking, Hopefully that won't come out too well or too bad, but uh, I figure I'm probably somewhere well below him in, in the ability to speak. Uh, for those of you that missed the message, see me after class. Um, and we have been blessed with uh, Professor Oppenheimer um, and several of the illustrious members of this class have spoken that I've had the pleasure of. It. And of course, there's always our leader and uh, teacher, Vic. And the, uh, I can't go by without mentioning the Fisher Boys. I mean, that, that was a, a treasure to watch each and every one of them. And I haven't grown up with them as, as you have, uh, but to see them step up and preach as they did, uh, and I mean preach, uh, share their life, um, is a huge testimony, not just to First Pres, but to their families um, and to the great men they're going to become. And I can definitely see them doing work for the Lord for years to come. I'd like to share a little bit of my background in coming to know the Lord uh, and also the tremendous opportunities that I've had. Uh, I grew up in California um, and I always remember coming to North Carolina in the late 90s. And uh, people would say to me, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> uh, and I always, I'll never forget my first sip of tea in North Carolina. <laughs> we were at the Big Pig and went out to our first lunch. And I said, I'll have tea. Everybody was ordering tea. And so I took one swig of my tea and, and my boss was sitting across the table from me and he almost got it in his face. <laughs> and I said, well, what in the world is that? So different way to drink it. California, we don't put any sweet. Uh, but... So, uh, so one amusing quirk that I wanted to share from my background is uh, being in the grocery business. Uh, I was with Food Lion, for those of you that don't know. Um, I've always found it, and I was with a grocery chain in California before I came back here. When I went on vacation, the one thing, one of the things that I always liked to do was go visit other grocery stores. Across the country, they're always amazing. Uh, some of them are more amazing than others, and 
because I had the privilege of traveling to Hawaii so many times, when I went there, I was really amazed that they could keep the store stocked. Uh, so I had to go in the back room, and you're not supposed to do that, but I just went in the back room. So they were unloading a truck, and I said, how does this process work? Because I just can't imagine it. And he says, well, we ordered on Sunday night. They loaded in a container in California, and it gets here on Wednesday morning. And they unload it and put it on the shelf. And it's like, we have places in the States that can't get things there that fast. So I was really amazed at what they had done. The other thing I like to do on vacation is I love to visit churches. And a lot of us like to go visit churches to see the beauty of the uh, structures that have been built. But I love to go see the people and hear the messages from different preachers. Uh, and have had uh, some great opportunities. Um, and I hate to be uh, consistent in this regard, but my favorite happens to be in Hawaii. There's a little stone church in south of Kona, Hawaii. The building is about 20 by 50. And it was built in 1855. And they hold services in this church today. Now, what they've done is they've expanded because... This church has a, a great pastor who happened to be an attorney in Florida. I don't know how good the attorneys are in Florida, but anyway, he was an attorney in Florida and decided he felt the call for the Lord to go to Hawaii and start preaching in Hawaii. So he went there, wasn't called, wasn't a missionary, went there looking for a church to preach in. And he was called into this church once he was there. Um, and his name is Bill Bartley. The name of the church is Livingstone's Church. Uh, and they have a piece of property that is right on the ocean next to one of the most, one of the nice speeches there <coughs> on the Big Island. <coughs> Huge grass area. <coughs> and they set up tents. They have one tent that will hold 200 and one that will hold 100. They have huge screen TVs out of these tents, and they have three services a day. So they can serve well over a 1,000 people on Sunday morning, and they do a pretty good job of it. When it's not really too hot, you can sit outside and just enjoy the waves crashing across the walks. You can even watch the surfers out there, as long as they don't distract you too much from the message. But it's a great place to visit. So if you're ever in Hawaii, that's definitely one of the highlights of the island from my perspective. Now a little bit more about my background. Um, because I was amazed at, 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 as John had mentioned, growing up in the church and, and the growth that, uh, that he gained through his life in the church and, and not having the opportunity to grow up in just one church. Uh, and not, not necessarily a church hopper. I mean, to start that off. But I was raised in the Methodist church because that's where my father had gone to church, although he didn't go to church. He just dropped us off at church. <laughs> uh, and so my brother and I attended the church. And I always remember going through the confirmation process in the Methodist church. I went to the classes. There were a couple months of classes that you went to in preparation for being prayed over and, and being told that you have God in your life now. Um, because when I got through, I didn't feel God was there. And the unfortunate part about, well, there's lots of unfortunate parts about that, but but I went through my teenage years without knowing the Lord. The good news is God was still watching over me. I don't know why, but he was, because he had a better plan for me. Um, so in my freshman year in college, uh, I met a young lady who many of our paths have seemed to drive from that direction. Um, and I went with her family to church. And that morning, I felt, well, that probably wasn't the first time I went, but subsequent visits, I felt a, 
call from the altar. I felt the Lord was calling me to, to come. I went down front, met with the minister. We talked for a while. I felt like I really knew the Lord after that. Um, the the follow-up to that is uh, I went through the baptism process because this happened to be a Baptist church. And so they don't, um, and it's a great process. I really felt a great deal of, from that um, uh, and enjoyed that church and served there for four or five years. Uh, I went on to a, a larger church. I won't go through every church that I've been to, but I went to a larger church uh, in, in that town. Uh, I was in Long Beach, California. Uh, it was a large Baptist church, and it had a pastor there by the name of Pastor McElhaney. I'll always remember Pastor McElhaney. He started his life Christian service, speaking from a soapbox in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Went on to become an ordained minister and wound up in California. But he had a spirit about him that, that was really a strong message from the Lord, uh, and we just really enjoyed that church. We went to Sunday school, and that's the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about this church, was that uh, we had a Sunday school class. It was called a toy match. So it was for the young couples that have children. I guess we're bending twigs for children. Uh, and uh, when we first went, there was like two dozen people that went to this little class. It was one of the smallest adult classes in the church. And, uh, but I made some great friends in that class. There were just some really wonderful Christians that were in that class that had been there for a while. And in, in talking with them, we talked about what we could possibly do with this class. And why was it so small? What could we do? Uh, so we started meeting regular. We started praying about the class. Uh, we came up with a plan to start having socials every month, uh, just a potluck or something. Uh, it went on to be uh, where we wanted something different than just a potluck social, something that would interest people. Um, so what could be better than golf? So we had the Twig Bender Open, which was a miniature golf tournament which were both the husbands and wives could participate in. I will say I won it once. Um, <laughs> and uh, we had another time where we, uh, we did the uh, Twig Bender Grand Prix, which was uh, we had go-kart race tracks. We went out there and raced. I didn't win that, but, uh, but it was a great time. And the intent was what we wanted to do, there were, there were people that, where women would come to the class because they bring their kids to Sunday school, but then the husbands wouldn't be there. And so we wanted something that we could get the husbands out to. And we knew if we got them out there, we could start building relationships. And that's exactly what happened. So we, we had these socials, we had uh, a potluck. We invited the, uh, the pastor to a couple of the socials. Uh, he was a, a, he really got engaged with the younger people. He was in his late, he was in his late 50s at the time, but he really liked being around the younger adults. Uh, and we had a decent teacher, and we switched off with the rotation that the church went through. But we, uh, we asked the pastor if he'd be interested in teaching the Sunday school. So he came in, and he, he taught it one time, and he loved it, and we loved him. And we said, you know what? We really feel that God's calling me to teach our class. <laughs> he bought it. And we had him teach the class from that point on. And he loved being it. And it wasn't a strain on him. It didn't seem to be a, it wasn't a strain on us. It didn't seem to be a strain on him. Um, and he was really enjoying, and it seemed to kind of revive him a little bit by being around younger people. Um, so about I'll just go about three years down the road culmination of our work one Sunday morning it was actually an Easter Sunday I'll take credit, I won't take credit for that part of it but it was an Easter Sunday we had 150 people in Sunday school class on Sunday. and it was just from the work and prayers that we had gone through and the Lord really shining and growing in the class and it was a great and, and that's the spirit 
that I see in this class. I see that as I speak to people in this class, that there's this love for one another, there's this joy for one another, and I, not that you need to be 150, but we could build another wing on the church, I'm sure. You guys can get anything done, I know. I also had the privilege of attending uh, Calvary Chapel out in California. Um, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to see the movie, The Jesus Revolution, uh, about the hippies, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And uh, they were out there. And this church was led by Chuck Smith. And in the, it's a pretty good depiction, although Kelsey Grammer is not nearly as gregarious and outspoken as Chuck Smith was. Uh, but it showed as he, as these people came into a church, not dissimilar to First Press, uh, and not wearing normal suit, Sunday attire, and were looked down upon. But if you saw the movie, it's, and if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth seeing. It's a success that really happened. Uh, it was written by Greg Laurie, who was one of the pastors that has uh, uh, that grew up in that church, and uh, he now runs Harvest Crusades across this country. So the, the spirit that's come out of that is just amazing. But it was always enjoyable to listen to Chuck Smith and to visit him. The one peculiarity he had is he did a sun, Sunday night Bible study. And if you got there, it started at 7 o'clock. And once you sat down, they did about 30 minutes of music. Then the Bible study started. Once the Bible study started, you stayed in your seat until 9 o'clock. They, they said they wouldn't let anybody out. Now, I never heard anybody fight that, but everybody was pretty much engaged once this, the, they started. So it was, it was really worth uh, being involved in. So two years ago, I'll jump ahead. Uh, two years ago, I uh, married my lovely wife, Elaine, in Hawaii, in a small chapel on the water, partially because we were right in the middle of COVID. We couldn't get anybody to come to a church to a wedding, so we figured we'd elope. And it worked great. Uh, we did get married and had a great experience. Um, she was from uh, the other Greenville, South Carolina, uh, and had attended Church of Christ Episcopal and uh, Greenville First Presbyterian. And during our dating process, we attended those churches a number of times. And I really would encourage you to attend First Pres in Greenville if you're there on a Sunday. It's definitely a great church. Um, so anyway, I brought my bride, uh, my <laughs> I brought my big city bride uh, <clears throat> kicking and screaming to this lovely little town. And we arrived at First Pres on Tomato Day in 2022, <laughs> where we have become happy members and enjoyed this ever since. So as I put a message together, I, uh, I, I wasn't looking to, uh, well, I actually read through the book and tried to, to put together a message. I couldn't get one, but I felt correlated to, to what I had just talked about. Um, and following Dr. Brad Trick, I didn't think I could probably do justice to a message, so I didn't want to be compared. So that said, um, I really looked uh, and prayed about what the God, what God would want me to talk about uh, and really felt that uh, what I needed to focus on was communication. And because God was communicating with me, I was trying to get him to communicate what should I talk about. And I realized that what we don't spend enough time doing, how many times have we got up in the morning, got up a little, maybe a few minutes late, we run out the door, we didn't spend any time with the Lord. How much better would our life have been to have taken our time to spend it? Now, 
sure all of you do spend your time first thing in the morning with the Lord. I'm not even going to not ask for a raise of hands, but I just know that it does help drive your day and make it better. So, and I do believe that God speaks with us today. Um, and I know he spoke with us in the old, in olden times. So I thought we'd go back to a little bit of interaction because all I've done is lecture and I don't think that's all that enjoyable. So let's talk about how God spoke to his people in the past. I'll take a speak out or raise the hands on how you felt the ways that God spoke to people in the past. Through the prophets. I did. Through the prophets. Others? As a voice in the wilderness. Direct revelation. I mean, he spoke to Adam, Noah, Abram, Moses. Fortunately, he didn't come into my den, my office, and <laughs> speak to me, or I'd be a puddle on the floor. But, but uh, those were ways that he spoke to people in the past. And even God's written word, the Ten Commandments, were ways that he spoke. Uh, through other people. Through circumstances. I always love Gideon's story the circumstances of putting the fleece down. Okay, God, that's not good enough. Let's do it again. That's That was bold. And yet it came out with great results. He used angels on occasion. Now those are primarily ways that we don't hear from God today. And that doesn't mean that God isn't speaking to us today. So how do you feel God is speaking to you in your normal daily life? Are there ways that you look to? Are there directions you look to? I think the scripture is timeless. Absolutely. That's the number one and most direct way we hear from him today. We're, I think we'd all be shocked if we heard a voice and you thought it truly was a word because there's nothing that says he would or doesn't say he wouldn't. I'd be a little worried if I heard it. <sighs> but we know that we are hearing from God through his word when we pray and we seek guidance about a decision <clears throat> and then we ask God to speak to us through his word. And then we have to go, but then we have to go back to the word to read the word to look for the answer because the answer is going to be there. Um, he does speak through the Holy Spirit in our lives because the Holy Spirit does dwell and live there. And he does speak through other people. Um, And sometimes he speaks through circumstances as well. I know I had a, I prayed uh, about something when I was in my 40s that uh, I thought uh, I was just at a quandary of where I was going with some things. My education, I had gone to school, uh, hadn't quite finished it up, I got through my junior year. And partially into my senior year. I was out riding in a car with my boss, who I didn't particularly care for. <laughs> um, because I figured he was a block to me, really didn't need it. And, and uh, he said, uh, why haven't you finished your education? I said, well, I've got you know, maybe a year, two years part-time. He said, how old are you you in two years? And I gave him a number. He said, how old will you be in two years if you don't do it? <laughs> and it's as, something as simple as that has stuck with me all these years that it made me go down to the school 
register and uh, complete my education. At the time, right before that, I actually prayed about my education and I thought, okay, I'm going to be 50 in five years. By the time I'm 50, I want to have run a marathon. I want to have my education. And I want to be vice president of the company. Now, those are kind of bold, not specific prayers that you ask for, but I continued to use them to help me get through my education. So I went and finished my education, got my bachelor's degree, and I enjoyed it so much that I decided to go ahead and get my master's degree, a masochist. Um, so I went through the, the process, and it wasn't too difficult, and, and, I, and I got that. I, I got up at 5 30 or five o'clock every morning and run three miles because I was hoping that I could get to a marathon because everybody was running a marathon. So it proves you're in good shape. You needed to run a marathon. There's a lot of stupidity in the world and that might be part of it. Um, <laughs> but I was enjoying running and it was, it was keeping me healthy. And on Sunday mornings before church, not instead of church, I would go, get up even earlier <clears throat> so I could get more miles. And I did get up to the point where I could run a half marathon. So I ran one half marathon. And then I continued to train, and I thought, I'm gonna run a marathon. And then I got up to about 16 or 17 miles, and I said, no, I'm not gonna run a marathon. <laughs> this is gonna destroy me. And I may have been right, but I did go run another half marathon. So I ran two half marathons and said, that's a marathon, I'm done. <laughs> So the, the third part of the, the uh, prayer was when I attended, uh, when I came back here to work for Food Line. Um, I didn't come back as a vice president, but about two years after I was back here, the position came open, I candidated for it. And the irony was that they really wanted a master's degree. And I just happened to have one. I got the position. Uh, and, and enjoyed serving there. So I do know that prayer works. I've used it many times. And yet I do know that people sometimes get discouraged because prayer doesn't get answered and they feel there's God's not listening. Well, it's not usually that God's not listening, because he's always listening. But I love the great country song, God's Greatest Gift, is Unanswered Prayers. If you haven't heard the song, it might be worth listening to once anyway. Uh, it specifically talks about a young woman that he had been pursuing. God didn't, he prayed for her, he didn't get her as his bride. And his life changed and he went on another direction. And as he looked back and reflected, God's greatest gift was he didn't give her that woman. He gave her a better woman, and a better life. And so God always has our best at mind. If we don't screw it up, we'll get there. Um, so sometimes if we pray, and we don't feel that God's answering, we may be asking for the wrong reasons. There may be some disobedience in our life. In John, 1 John 3.22, it says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And a lot of preachers will use that and say, you can get anything you want because God will give it to you. No, what it says is if we keep his commandments and do things that are pleasing in his sight, he will look favorably on us. So if we're not getting an answer to prayer, we need to go back and judge ourselves and make sure that we're walking in alignment with God. 
The other is asking outside of the will of God. Um, in 1 John 5, 14, it says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he will hear this. But if it's outside of his will, we won't grant it. So we again, we need to analyze what we're asking for in prayers. And then lastly, and this has always been a difficult one for me to find. It took me years to hear it, although I probably heard it in many sermons. Uh, Isaiah 55, 8. My plans are not your plans, nor are your ways my ways, say the Lord. So sometimes, even though everything seems like it should be in the line, and we're asking for exactly what we think we want, and it's going to be great for us, it's going to be great for our families, whatever, it's not God's plan. And it's hard to come up to accept that. And that can be one of the more difficult elements of life. I will end with, uh, I, I have to go through this because uh, one of the Fisher plays came in with a bunch of statistics. And while I'm not going to put them on the screen, I have to give you these statistics because they they're really have some value to them. Hebrews 10.25 says, not neglecting the meeting together. So that's about getting to church, getting to Sunday school, meeting together as a group, how important that is, how important church activity is. And so I heard this statistic, and it's from a group called the Barna Group. I don't know if any of you know them. Uh, they have a 40-year history. They're in Dallas. Uh, they're designed for the insights about faith and generations. And these statistics came from them. Those that have two parents, children that have two parents, know Christ, and the parents are active in the church, are 93% likely to receive Christ. Those that have one parent, that knows Christ and is active in the church have a 74% chance of coming to know the Lord. Where there's two parents that know Christ, but they don't attend regular, maybe Christmas and Easter, the children are 52% likely to come to know the Lord. But if they have two parents that know Christ, but they're not active in the church at all, there's only a 6% chance they'll come to know the Lord. So I think what that says is we need to spend our time in church. There's more value to it to our families than we even know about. And uh, this is truly uh, a great church and a great Sunday school class. And again, I appreciate this opportunity.